I'm meteorologist Rob Carolyn. Next on AM 1480 WLEA, the Newsmaker Show. Here's Ryan O'Neill. Well, he's a regular guest on Tuesdays, but things got shuffled around this week, so we could have uh, Brian Kilmeade on. Welcoming right now, Alfred University history professor, Dr. Gary Ostrauer. Dr. Ostrauer, thanks for calling in today. Hey, my pleasure, Brian. Well, so much to talk about. Uh, let's start out with the uh, explosives devi- explosive devices being sent around to uh, prominent Democrats. Uh, Brian, uh, just um, excuse me for a moment, but I do want to make uh, just a short announcement. And that is uh, something that should be, I hope, relevant to people in uh, Steuben County, Allegheny County. Uh, and that is that there's going to be a debate. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it is going to be the only debate in the congressional race in our district uh, this year. Uh, it's a debate between Congressman Reed uh, and his challenger, Dr. Tracy Matrano. Uh, it's going to occur exactly one week from today, that is to say November 1st, uh, at 7 o'clock, and that is going to be in Olean High School. Uh, there, there has not been a lot of publicity around here. I think there's been much more, of course, in the Olean area, uh, but I think that will likely be of some real interest to uh, uh, Republicans uh, and Democrats, both in, uh, in, in, in our area. Uh, so far as the uh, news today is concerned, look, we don't, there's a lot that we don't know. There may be more that we don't know at this point than that we do know. Uh, it could turn out to be one of those really, really consequential moments, uh, even in you know, 21st century history. Uh, there are some precedents for this sort of thing. Uh, you may or may not remember from you know, courses in history that you've taken uh, that uh, following the Civil War, uh, there was an attempt uh, on the life of, uh, well, of course, Lincoln was, uh, was assassinated. On the very, very same day, there was an attempt on the life of his vice president. Uh, there was a very, very serious attack on the Secretary of State, William Seward, who came from uh, Auburn, New York, not very far from here. Seward was, uh, 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 was uh, stabbed, uh, and he was disfigured for the rest of his life. Uh, he was almost killed in that, uh, and there were some other people also involved. In other words, it was a fairly widespread plot. So this isn't the first time that we've had these kinds of assassination attempts. On the other hand, you know, was this really an assassination attempt? The answer is, in all likelihood, it was. But, you know, I think that one has to be a little bit cautious at this early time. One of the interesting things, to me at least, is that none of these bombs, right now I think there have been eight bombs that have been found, yet none of them exploded. Well, why not? And the answer is, we don't know whether it might have been incompetence on the part of the bomb maker. We don't know whether it might have had something to do with uh, the way in which the bombs were armed. In other words, uh, you know, that they would explode not based on a timer, but rather based on, uh, you know, the opening of the package. We just don't know. And so I think, you know, we have to at least leave a little bit of a question mark as to what's going on. Uh, there have been some Republicans who have claimed that, and I shouldn't say Republicans, but really conservatives, who have complained that, uh, this was a, quote, false flag operation. In other words, that the Democrats actually sent these bombs to discredit the Republicans. Uh, that's possible. I mean, anything is possible, but it's very, very unlikely. And so, you know, I think we're going to have to proceed for the time being uh, on the idea that, yeah, it was uh, uh, you know, supporters of Trump, supporters of the president, who were targeting, literally targeting, uh, some of the most vocal, some of the most visible critics of the president. Yeah, we just, at this point, uh, we just don't know um, where it came from, which side, and all that. Uh, we're talking with uh, Dr. Gary Ostrauer, Alfred University history professor. Can we do a couple of this days in history, Gary? Yeah, but Br- Brian, I'd like to stay on the issue of the bombing for a little bit, because okay. uh, the, pr- the president made a comment yesterday evening. Uh, you know, he called the bombing despicable. Uh, He said that, you know, we really have to create more unity. And I think it was, you know, in some ways a promising statement. And yet that promising statement is undermined in in, in a very, very important fashion, I think, by the degree to which the president has never been willing to accept responsibility for his own role in all of this. And I don't mean a role in the sense that somehow he had, uh, you know, planned this bombing or he knew who the bombers were or he financed it or something along those lines or that he encouraged it in an explicit way. 
But what the president has done is to create an environment that makes this sort of violence more likely. Uh, you know, just within the last week, just within the last seven days or so, uh, you know, he praised a uh, congressman who had body slammed a reporter and then made light of it, you know, kind of joked around about it. Uh, you know, he, we know that he has promised to pay legal fees for uh, some of his own supporters when they attack, physically attack, uh, protesters. Uh, he has incited violence at his own rallies. He says he wants to, you know, punch these protesters. Now, punching a protester is very, very different from sending a bomb to Hillary Clinton or to a former president of the United States, such as Obama or, you know, to those six other people. But, you know, the point that I'm making here is that the president has incited violence Indirectly, if not directly, the president has been more important as, in, in his role as president. I mean, he's the most visible character, so to speak, in the United States of America. Uh, you know, he has kind of incited a, uh, uh, an atmosphere here that, you know, leads to people doing the sorts of things that apparently have been doing, uh, you know, to, to, to the kind of bombing that we have seen or the attempt to bomb uh, that we've seen just in the last couple of days here. Uh, yeah, he has to grant responsibility. And so he went on yesterday to say that, you know, the problem has been the, the press. Okay, it's you guys. It's the mainstream press, the, and which he calls the fake media. But the reality is that it's not the press. The press is reporting, and the press has been reporting very responsibly for the most part. You know, you may, you know, people may buy propaganda, his own propaganda, that the New York Times and the Washington Post are fake news. But they're really not fake news. And what I would suggest to people who think they are fake news is to read the New York Times. You can get it online. Okay, to read the Washington Post, which you can also get online. In other words, the people who continue to believe that they are fake news are, for the most part, people who never, ever, ever actually read these newspapers, people who never really watch CNN, which was one of the targets of this uh, alleged bombing. And so, you know, Mr. Trump, you better take some responsibility, and you better start taking responsibility for telling the truth, because when you fabricate things, and he is the most dishonest president in our entire history of presidents, going all the way back to George Washington. When you, when you are dishonest, you're showing a kind of disdain, a lack of respect for the American public. Talking with uh, Alfred University uh, history professor, uh, Dr. Gary Ostor. did you want to continue with current events or do uh, a little this day in history? Well, I, I, I think that, look, I mean, I, I, I've been a frequent critic of the president uh, on this program, and I want to give you some credit here, because, you know, on one hand, you have programs on WLEA, you have Rush Limbaugh for a number of hours, you have Hannity for a number of hours, but by the same token, you're willing to have people like myself on who are critics. In other words, there's a diversity of views, of views. Uh, uh, you know, Robert Kennedy Jr., uh, and so forth. So I think that, you know, it's important that we have a, a range of viewpoints. And often, uh, certainly on cable news, we see less and less of this. I think that we have to accept the fact that, you know, there is a range. And not only is there a range, and this is very, very important, and this is something else, I think, which the president refuses to recognize, that people who disagree with you may have something to say. They may be, in fact, they may have a legitimate point of view, and at the very, very least, they are loyal, okay? There, there's a loyal opposition. Uh, the president may not recognize that. But for most of American history, with the exception of the 1860s, we have accepted the idea that the opposition is not evil, to accept the opposition, the idea that the opposition is not subversive, we have accepted the idea that the opposition is, is, is loyal. That's existed in Great Britain. It's existed in the United States, and one hopes, one hopes we can return to that, uh, you know, in the 21st century. Thank you for the uh, compliment in there about WLEA having uh, a number of views. Uh, we do try to do that. And uh, I would say is a pro programming philosophy. One of the things we try to do is have the most popular shows from both sides. Uh, Ring of Fire, which you mentioned in there, Robert Kennedy Jr. Uh, that's probably one of the biggest uh, Democrat shows out there. And uh, as you said, we, you know, we have Rush Limon, Sean Hannity, the, the two biggest conservative shows out there. Uh, so we try to do that and uh, get a variety of views on there. Uh, quickly on this day in history, 
1972, on this day in history, Nixon suspended the bombing of North Vietnam. 1973, Nixon vetoes the War Powers Resolution. Your thoughts on those two days, Gary? Well, <laughs> Nixon became president in 1968. He was elected president in 1968. Of course, he became president the following year in January. And when he ran for president, he ran for president on a platform that, among other things, emphasized, number one, law and order. And he did that because there were riots in American cities, racial riots for the most part in American cities, uh, in about 100 American cities, maybe a little bit over 100, uh, following the assassination of Martin Luther King in 1968. Uh, there was just a kind of social explosion in this country. Uh, that was followed, of course, a couple months later by the assassination of Robert Kennedy. Uh, there was a great deal of disorder, and Nixon's law and order uh, uh, appeal uh, was certainly, you know, geared to, uh, to to some of that. By the same token, he also promised, he said, that I have a secret plan. He didn't actually use that phrase, but he says, I have a secret plan to end the war in uh, in Vietnam. Well, he did not have a secret plan to end the war in Vietnam. And so the war continued through 1969, through 1970, 71, into 1972 when he suspended the bombing. And by that time, the number of American troops in Vietnam had been uh, had been reduced significantly. Uh, th there's some um, a lot of bombing, a great deal of bombing. Certainly, in during in April of 1962, it was called the Easter bombing, and then later in December, which was called the Christmas bombing. Uh, did those have anything to do with an end to the war? Well, it's hard to say because the war was clearly uh, w w was winding down anyhow. But the, the the larger point, I guess, I'm trying to make is that. Uh, by 1972, the United States had generally, and I say the United States meaning the American people, had tired of the war, whether they were anti-war to begin with or they were a pro-war to begin with, but were becoming increasingly frustrated and increasingly tired with the degree to which there was no resolution in sight. And so in January of 1973... The war finally ended. It was sad. It was the first war in American history that we actually lost. Again, you know, the president uh, did, would, would refused to accept responsibility uh, for what he had done. But, uh, yeah, the war was over, and uh, there were long-term effects of, from, of, from the Vietnam War, not the least of which was a lack of trust in our government, a lack of trust which I think is even more present, even more uh, 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 more you know, present today than it was uh, back in 1973. Gary, quick uh, history question. Um, in 1968, it was uh, Humphrey, Hubert Humphrey, that was the uh, Democrats' candidate uh, because uh, President Johnson uh, decided not to run. Had Robert Kennedy not been shot, uh, would it have been uh, Lyndon Johnson or Hubert Humphrey or Robert Kennedy uh, who ended up being the Democrat candidate in 68 to run against Nixon? Who do you think it would have been? Well, I, hard to say, and you're, you're, you're forgetting one other character sure. who became a very, very important element in that election, and that was Eugene McCarthy, okay, who was a Democratic right. senator, an anti-war senator from Minnesota. Uh, my guess is that uh, it would have been Robert Kennedy. Uh, he ha was immensely popular among Democrats generally. He was considered to be ruthless. Uh, certainly, I think that Humphrey felt that Robert Kennedy had kind of, you know, betrayed R Humphrey and his role. Uh, Humphrey had been the vice president under Lyndon Johnson. He considered himself in some ways to be the heir apparent of Johnson, and he did run ultimately as a Democratic candidate. Uh, Kennedy, of course, was shot in, uh, he was assassinated in June of 1968. Uh, Kennedy then won in a very, very chaotic convention. Uh, he won the nomination, uh, and he went on to lose to Nixon by a tiny, tiny percentage. If I'm not mistaken, it was something like 48.8% to 48.7%. It was a very, very close election. But the fact of the matter is that Nixon won the election, and then, of course, the war would became, you know, became his responsibility uh, from then on. You know, Nixon was himself not a very uh, you know, honest person. He was known generally back in that period as Tricky Dick.
And yet, while he was very anti-communist and while he offered himself to the American public as a real conservative, the fact of the matter is that Nixon could not be nominated by the Republican Party today because he'd be viewed as too liberal. It was Nixon who established the EPA, the Environmental Protection Administration. Uh, he was responsible, or at least in part responsible, certainly signed the Clean Water Act of 1972, the Clean Air Act. Uh, he was he expanded the national park system rather than uh, rather than reduced its size as President Trump is doing. Uh, in many ways, I think that Nixon would have been considered too liberal for the Republican Party today. Late on taking a break, want to get back with you in just a moment. Alfred University history professor Dr. Gary Ostrauer, stay with us. It's October, and the holidays will be here in no time. So now is the time to get that new floor installed before the guests arrive. At Mullen Factory Direct Floor Covering in Almond, they stock over 400,000 square feet of flooring. If you need carpet, vinyl, laminate, or hardwood, Mullen's got it. Quality and durable floor coverings. And your new floor can be installed by their professionals right now. Now with no box door wait. Special financing including 0% interest is available too. Mullen Factory Direct Floor Covering and Almond. Stop by and let them floor you. Went to a graduation once where the uh, speaker talked about the three C's. Confidence, courage, and compassion. Well today, meteorologist Rob Carroll has the two C's in the forecast. That's right, cold and crummy. It is not a very nice looking day coming up, Brian. Nor it's a nice looking stretch. A lot of cloudiness out there this morning. It stretches all the way up into western New York and into parts of Ontario. There are a few breaks here and there, so the sun may peak out now and again. But I think clouds are going to hold the upper hand, particularly this morning. Temperature is going to be about 45 to 50. We had sunrise earlier this morning at 736. It'll set tonight at 612. Now tonight, the clouds, they're going to hold across the region. Our lows overnight about 30 to 35. We'll see more cloudiness tomorrow. Not quite as cold. It starts to warm up a little bit. We'll get to about 50 to 55 tomorrow afternoon. Scattered showers for tomorrow night, lows 35 to 40. And it's going to rain off and on Saturday, 45. We'll see more showers, cool temperatures right into Sunday, Brian. Thank you, Rob. Back with Alfred University history professor Dr. Gary Ostrauer, uh, who's usually on a Tuesday, but uh, things got a little juggled around this week, so we get our Brian Kilby down. Uh, Dr. Ostrauer, in the last segment you mentioned... Um, and we both mentioned uh, Hubert Humphrey, the uh, Democrats uh, candidate for uh, a president in 1968 who ran against uh, Richard Nixon and lost. There was a famous uh, flub by uh, President Jimmy Carter at one of the Democrat conventions, I believe. And he introduced Hubert Humphrey as Hubert Horatio Hornblower. Uh, and I think Carter, I think they jumped on him way too much for that. Uh, Jimmy Carter was definitely a smart guy. And uh, people tried to portray him as stupid for saying that. Horatio Hornblower was, uh, uh, I believe, uh, a Navy character in a series of novels, and they made radio shows and movies out of him. Uh, be that as it may, Doctor Ostrar, do you think what is the Jimmy Carter legacy years after the, his presidency? Because you know he's had, he's had a lot of criticisms. What do you make of Carter? Well, look, Carter, I think, was one of the smartest presidents who served during the entire 20th century. I think that Carter has been, uh, you know, in some ways, well, he was a one-term president. And generally speaking, we tend not to value one-term one, one presidents. We call them failures. That would be true of uh, Hoover. That would be true of Carter. I don't think Carter was a failure. I think that in many ways he established things uh, that we are building on to this very, very day, not the least of which is going to be an emphasis on human rights in uh, foreign policy. Now, that has been eclipsed, of course, during the Trump administration. Trump, I think, has no respect whatsoever for human rights. But until then, I, th I think both Democrats and Republicans have given that a good deal of respect. Uh, by the same token, I think that a good deal of our environmental legislation can go back to both the uh, Nixon administration and also the Carter administration. Uh, the uh, Panama Canal Treaty, where we finally rectified a wrong that we had done way, way back at the beginning of the 20th century. I think that in many ways, Carter really was a pretty admirable president. He wasn't entirely successful. And, of course, we all know that he was in many ways eclipsed as a result of the Iran hostage crisis uh, that you know, basically consumed the last year or so of his presidency. But I do think that he was an important president. And if I make, make another historical comment here, Brian Kilmeade was on your program 
two days ago, and he talked about uh, Andrew Jackson. He talked about Jackson because he just published a biography of Jackson. And one of the questions you asked him was, uh, to compare uh, the degree to which we could compare uh, Andrew Jackson on one hand and Donald Trump on the other. And uh, Brian Kilmeade gave a pretty favorable view of Trump in respect to the virtues of Jackson. But one thing that he did not say, and I think once again it may betray some of his own politics, and that is that Andrew Jackson was a genuine military leader not a good not only a good military leader but in some ways a hero he was the guy who planned who executed okay who eventually won the battle of new orleans which was an incredibly important battle at the end of the uh, war of 1812 yes i realize that the peace treaty had already been signed but people on this side of the atlantic didn't know that yet and that battle resulted in about 3000 british casualties t- compared to less to fewer than 100 American casualties. Uh, Jackson was a real military character. In contrast to Donald Trump, who five times avoided service during the Vietnam War. He was what, you know, his critics would call, and I don't know that we should use this word, uh, 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 you know, in a very loose way, but, you know, kind of a draft dodger. There are many people who sought to avoid the draft during the Vietnam War. Donald was among them. Uh, Trump at one point said that, you know, his real sacrifice during the Vietnam War was not contracting a venereal disease. That's what he said to uh, a radio commentator, uh, Stern, at one point or another. Uh, uh, You know, that's not something to be proud of, and I think that one, in that sense, uh, you know, has to contrast rather unfavorably the uh, Trump candidacy on one hand with uh, Andrew Jackson way back during the 1820s. Well, with that, uh, we have to leave it. Dr. Ostrauer, as always, thank you for coming on. My pleasure, Brian.